Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining me for, for the talk today. So yeah, my name is Daria. I am a PhD student. I'm affiliated with Trinity College and Faculty of Economics here at Cambridge. And today I'd like to talk about experiments in economics and what we can learn from them. I hope that the topic will be new to most of you. And so hopefully this will be interesting um, and, and fairly engaging. Uh, now, um, let's start with the following situation. Imagine it's 1997, you live in the UK. Uh, we're still pretty much pre-digital and conventional newspapers are still very popular. You are an avid reader of Financial Times and among other newspapers. And one day you open the newspaper and you see the following advert in it. Now, the Financial Times is announcing a competition for a chance to win two return club class, which you know, is a fancy type of business class that was the case back in the day. So two return club class tickets to New York or Chicago. And to take part in the competition, you simply need to guess an integer from zero to 100 with a goal of making your, your guess as close as possible to two thirds of the average guess of all the participants in the contest. And now to help you think more about this puzzle, suppose that there are three players who guessed 20, 30 and 40 respectively. In this case, the average guess would be 30 and two thirds of, of that would make it 20. So the person who guesses 20 or as close to 20, um, in this case, 20 exactly, uh, that person would win. Now, I'd like you to just take a minute of your time to think about how you would approach this, this task and, and sort of just note down your guess somewhere on a piece of paper. Okay, so hopefully everyone's made their guess by now. Uh, keep your record number close. We'll come back to, to it in a bit later. Now, uh, before coming back to the newspaper competition, I'd like us to take a little bit of a boring detour from, from it into the domain of definitions. I went on Google and asked it to define economics for me. It responded with, economics is the social science that studies production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. Well, perhaps instead of asking Google, I should have asked GBD4 for a better definition, but it is what it is. Now, while economics is indeed concerned with production, distribution, consumption, this definition seems lacking, at least to me. Uh, that is, the definition of economics given here through, is through the prism of the process of, of production, of consumption, etc. But it doesn't really have a clear indicator of who the agent behind all of those processes is. And clearly, this actor... Uh, responsible for production, distribution, consumption choices uh, is, is the humankind. So I searched for a better definition now on Wikipedia and arrived at this one offered by Robbins. So economics is the science which studies human behavior as a relationship between ends and scarce means which have alternative uses. Now, this one is clearly better because it both succinctly describes the processes economics is interested in and captures the, the agent who is responsible for, for all of those processes. Uh, now, uh, who is this human being who uses scarce means to satisfy a variety of ends and is subject uh, of attention of economics? Um, here, the starting point for us would be the definition offered by John Stuart Mill, who was the great thinker of the 19th century. And so Mill proposed uh, this portrait of humans as being um, these beings who inv inevitably does that by which he may obtain the greatest amount of necessary conveniences and luxuries with the smallest quantity of labor and physical self-denial with which they can be obtained. In effect, Mill proposed this portrait of human humankind as self-interested 
agents who are concerned with maximizing their own wealth while minimizing efforts exerted to achieve that wealth. And it is Mill who has effectively given birth to the idea of homo economicus, which has dominated economics thought throughout pretty much the 19th and the 20th century. Now, so homo economicus is this portrayal of humans as agents who are consistently rational and narrowly self-interested and who pursue their subjectively defined ends optimally. Uh, here, I'd like to pay attention to those words that I've highlighted in, in bold. So humans are rational, self-interested, and they're able to make optimal decisions. Uh, these are the ideas that have been key for neoclassical e economists of the 19th century and have pretty much dominated the 20th century. So um, the great thinkers, including you know, John Stuart Mill, whom we just talked about, but also Adam Smith, Edgeworth, uh, Jevons, uh, Walrus, Pareto, and many others embraced these ideas. Uh, these assumptions uh, made by neoclassical economics may at first seem innocuous, but they have been the building blocks of much of the economics thoughts and allowed the discipline to build systematic models uh, that accurately describe and explain a wide variety of processes that we're interested in. Okay. Um, however, that is not to say that these assumptions are bulletproof and work well for predicting anything concerning human behavior in the context of economics. Uh, quite the opposite. I can name dozens and dozens of scenarios where human behavior would not be just slightly off from the predictions of neoclassical theory, but can be actually diametrically opposite of what the theory suggests. Um, and Economics experiments can greatly help us in understanding where neoclassical assumptions work well, where they fail, and why they fail. So let us come back to this newspaper contest that I've just touched upon at the beginning of this talk uh, and, and think about it and how, um, how a neoclassical thinker could have approached this, um, this problem. Recall that the goal was to pick a number that was as close as possible to two-thirds of the average number guessed by other contestants. What was your guess and how did you make your guess? Well, perhaps you thought that it's impossible to predict what the winning guess would be and so simply picked a random number. That's one way of doing it. Or maybe you thought that everyone else would pick a random number and so on average they'll pick 50. And that would mean that the winning number would be 33, which is two thirds of 50. Now, maybe you thought that everyone would recognize this, this line of thinking. And so everyone would play 33, which would make you choose 22, two thirds of, 20, of 33. Or perhaps you expected everyone to continue unraveling this, this type of reasoning further, suggesting that the winning choice would be zero. Okay, neoclassical economics assumes that all humans are consistently rational and are able to make optimal decisions. And within this framework, uh, we would expect them to be able to perform arbitrarily hard calculations. As a consequence, under this framework, the only plausible winning number is zero. Moreover, standard economics would predict that all contestants will pick zero. But how do humans fare in real life? Well, this exact experiment that I've introduced to you was in fact conducted by Richard Thaler, who's a professor of behavioral science and economics at uh, the University of Chicago uh, and uh, a, a Nobel Prize winner of 2000, what was that, seven, I believe? Uh, no, 2000, a bit later, maybe 2017, I think. Uh, by the way, Thaler has written some easily accessible books, including Nudge and Misbehaving. I've dropped down the names here. So if you do want to read something economics related, I recommend those books to you. Um, so he conducted this exact experiment in, fi in Financial Times in the UK in 1997. And interestingly, Independently and simultaneously, a similar experiment was conducted by Bosch, Dominic, and Nagel in, in Spain, uh, with pretty much the same setup, but different prizes. Now, in the case of the Financial uh, Times experiments, about 1,500 people participated in the contest. And on the right here, you can see the histogram of relative frequencies of people's guesses. Now, immediately you can see that there are sharp peaks around 33 and 22, which we have already discussed. Another small peak at 15, which is two thirds of 22. Yet another one here, which is a 10, again, two thirds of 15. There's also quite a pronounced peak at zero and a stark one just short of zero here, probably like one or something. Um, in fact, the average guess was about 19, and so the winning number was 13. 
Oh, and by the way, you can also see here that there were a few gases of 100 and close to 100, clearly indicating that those contestants probably did not understand the task correctly. And also the same goes for these rare ones above 50, which is the, you can't see very well, but they're there. And anyhow, so those choices are difficult to rationalize. Um, yeah, and the experiment that was conducted by you know, Domenech and, and Nagel in, in Spain yielded very similar results. Okay, so um, hopefully, you know, uh, some of you have have guessed sort of close to close to that or thereabouts. Uh, let's proceed with with talking about what we learned from this experiment. Now, uh, the first interesting thing is clearly people are are not necessarily rational, nor do they expect others to be rational. For because if if everyone was rational, then then we would see the winning number being zero, and nineteen is clearly nineteen and thirteen are clearly far from zero. Now this observation goes in in stark contrast with the assumptions of neoclassical economics, which assumes that human beings are rational. Well, why do we even care? Um, we we as economists care about it because uh, because of um, uh, our ability to predict reality. Recall that you know our model, the neoclassical model, predicts that the only solution to this contest is zero, and the winning number turns out to be thirteen, which only means that our model is not very helpful in predicting behavior, and so it's of, of limited use. And so findings like these uh, have a profound implication on economics models and the ability of our models to accurately capture reality and predict future. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about it in a bit, but uh, we can think about things like asset bubbles and financial crisis um, in terms of um, the, the experiment that we've just talked about um, and draw par parallels there. In particular, so these ideas have exemplified by this experiment, they're not really new. And in fact, they date back to much before Thaler, Bosch, Dominic, and Nagel, and can be back, traced back to John um, Keynes, a distinguished British economist of the early 20th century who studied mathematics at Cambridge and later worked here as a scholar. Now, Keynes believed that similar behavior is at work within the stock market, whereby investors price shares not based on what they think an asset's fundamental value is, or even what investors think other investors believe about the asset values, but on what they think other investors believe is the average opinion about the value of the asset, or perhaps even higher order assessments. Um, drawing this parallel to stock markets hopefully makes it clearer that understanding human behavior and being able to accurately predict it can have pr profound impacts on economists. This was just one example of how an economics experiment can be used uh, um, to 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 enhance our understanding of human behavior and better, build better models. Now, experimental economics is the application of scientific experimental methods to study economics questions, and the discipline existed since at least late 20th century. In uh, 2007, Vernon Smith, um, who's pictured here, was awarded the Nobel Prize for his experimental work. And th this was the point when the discipline has been firmly established in, in um, the domain of economics. Smith dedicated his time to study financial transactions between individuals and how those transactions shape markets and what factors affect market performance. Uh, since his work in the late 20th century, the methodology of experimental economics grew considerably, and it is now, in fact, Fact, a discipline in itself. It's not just a tool for researchers. Now, so what exactly are experiments in economics? Uh, effectively, economics experiments can take form of standalone choices like this newspaper experiment we have just talked about, or a series of numerous interactions with other participants in a, in a dynamic setting, much like playing a game. So here, uh, participants would probably come together into, into an office, uh, sit in front of computers and, and interact uh, with each other in, in a specific environment. It's important though to keep in mind that economics experiments are not simulations or role-playing exercises. What distinguishes them from World of Warcraft or whatnot is that the decisions that are made by people are made for real and participants stand to earn or lose a substantial amount of money or a valuable prize like the, the fancy plane tickets in the newspaper contest. Um, more commonly, of course, we're talking about um, an opportunity to earn a variable amount of cash and that amount would depend on subjects own choices, the rules of the experiment and the choices of other people that are participating in the experiment. 
Um, how are experiments in economics conducted? Well, there are many different ways. Um, in the early days of the discipline, most experiments were conducted in a laboratory, uh, which was not a physics or chemistry laboratory, more like an office filled with, with computers where people would sit in front of the computers um, and um, read instructions and then make decisions on their computers. Now, in recent years, online studies have gained popularity. Here, the mechanics are very similar to laboratory experiments, except that subjects can enjoy the convenience of staying at home or, or anywhere else, really, where they have access to a computer and, and decent internet connection. Um, now, um, a separate uh, type of an experiment is a field experiment, and this is an experiment that's called, conducted in the wild. Uh, these studies take many different forms and shapes uh, and includes the, the experiment in financial times that we have just talked about. So this uh, people that were participating in this contest didn't know that they were taking part in, in an actual economics experiment, um, and the data was valuable for, for research purposes. Uh, now, um, so what can we use experiments for? Uh, well, as I just told you uh, already, so economics experiments are a systematic application of scientific methods, and we can apply the scientific methods to test predictions of existing theories, uh, stress test theories, test assumptions of those theories, and identify stylized facts. And finally, we can also use them to develop new theories. So here on the right, I have like this, this little description of the scientific method. Basically, you would uh, find some observational question that's of interest to you, then research that question, formulate hypothesis, design an experiment to test those hypotheses, analyze your data, report conclusions, and iterate, and iterate, and iterate until you're satisfied with, um, with, your, with your theory. Now, uh, in the rest of the talk, I'd like us to talk a bit more about testing assumptions, and in particular, testing assumptions of neoclassical economics. Um, recall that the key assumptions of neoclassical economics with respect to human behavior are rationality, self-interestedness, and being able to make optimal decisions. Um, now, we have already seen earlier on the example of Thaler's experiment that people are not always rational, and nor they expect others to be rational. Now, in the rest of the talk, I'd like us to talk more about the other assumption, uh, self-interestedness, uh, and how experiments can be used to test this assumption and inform economists of um, real, real human, human behavior. Um, before we move on to the description of more formal experiments, consider the following cake dilemma. Imagine that you and your friend meet up in a cafe for coffee and cake. There are two of you. And you have very similar tastes when it comes to cake, but when you come to the cafe, you discover that there is only one portion of your favorite cake left. Unfortunately, you are told that this is the last slice and no more is coming today. Uh, you are the first in the queue to make the order. And so now you're faced with the dilemma of how to deal with the situation. What would you do? Uh, well, I can give you a few options to choose from and, and you just pick whichever one you feel is, is closer to, to you, whichever one you feel like, like that, that, that's what, what you do in this situation. So um, the first option is you decide to pass on the dessert and let your friend have it. It's, it's nice to be nice. Or you could offer to share the dessert. Your friends after all, and so you could share. There's no big deal. Or maybe you offer to split the dessert equally and you actually proceed with carefully dividing the, the cake into two. Uh, and even split seems only fair. Uh, or maybe you decide to have all the dessert to yourself. After all, it's your friend uh, who's second. And so, you know, if, if they were first, they would have done the same. Uh, or perhaps you decide to take all of that dessert yourself and also take as many other desserts that are left in the cafe. You're too full to eat up, but it's nice feeling to have more than other people. Uh, so what would you choose? Okay, uh, let me proceed. So there's really no right or wrong response here. Um, in fact, people have different preferences, which are determined by what we call social value orientations. Now, social value orientations describe and categorize people according to their personal attitudes about distributing finite resources, in this case, cake. 
Um, this concept broadly distinguishes between two categories of decision makers. So people who have a more team oriented approach, which we, we use, usually label as pro-social. And those with a more egocentric focus, whom we refer to as individualists. Now, um, we can make a fine discretization and identify five different types of people. And in fact, depending on your answer to the cake dilemma, you can classify yourself as follows. If you decided to leave all your cake to all the cake to the friend, then you are an altruist. Altruists are people with a tendency to act selflessly. They frequently place other people's interests above their own and have a generous approach to the sharing of resources. If you picked option two, then that means that you are of a co cooperative time, type. People with a cooperative SVO are team players who prioritize the group's interests over their own. They usually strive to maximize the outcome of the team, and even if that means sacrificing some personal gains. If you picked to, div to, to divide the cake equally between you and your friend, that means that you are an equality-seeking type. Uh, equality-seeking individuals are motivated by fairness. They like to divide resources equally to ensure that everybody involved receives the exact same amount. Um, if you picked option four, that means that you're individualist. People with individualistic preferences are concerned with maximizing their personal gains. They typically prioritize their own self-interest and strive to satisfy these before considering other people's outcome. And finally, if you decided to not only cake, it, it, cake but also, also many other cakes as possible, um, in, that are left in the cafe, that means that you're of a competitive type. Competitive people are motivated by the aim of winning. They like doing better than others and typically share resources in a way that increases the difference between themselves and other individuals. Okay, uh, hopefully no one is embarrassed by their choices because as I said, there's no, there's no right and wrong answer here. We're all different and, and our motivations are different. Um, now, coming back to neoclassical assumptions, recall that neoclassical economics assumes that all people are concerned with maximizing their own personal gains. And basically, what that means is that under that framework, neoclassical economics only recognizes individualistic type of people uh, and assumes that everyone is individualist. However, while many of you might have approached the cake dilemma as an individualist, research has shown that the absolute majority of people are either individualist or, or, or of a cooperative type. And these are more or less uh, represented equally in the population. So about 50% of people would be individualist and 50% would be of cooperative type. The rest of the types are quite rare. Now, um, coming back to an economics experiment, of course, the question is, is you know, it, it's not about cake. So how, how might an, an economist uh, try to uncover people's social values um, in, in, a, in an experiment? Um, of course, the researcher would probably want to avoid sharing cake and instead focus on real money. Uh, for example, a researcher could recruit subjects to uh, conduct the following study online. Um, here, uh, we can think of an ultimatum game, which was uh, proposed by John Harsani in 1961. Consider a pair of people, I'll call them subjects, because they're subjects in an experiment, and we will randomly select one of them to be a proposer endowed with, say, £10. The proposer is tasked with splitting this amount with the other player, who we call him the responder, who knows what the total is. Now, assume for simplicity that the proposer must offer the responder a, a non-negative amount, but can offer as little as one penny. That is, offer a split whereby the proposer keeps 9.99 himself or herself, and the responder receives one penny. Now, once the proposer communicates his decision, the responder may accept or reject it. If the responder accepts the proposal, then the money split in the way that the, the proposer proposed. And then if the responder rejects, then both players receive nothing. Finally, assume that both players know in advance the consequences of the responder accepting or rejecting the offer. So all the rules are known to, to everyone in this game. Now, uh, what do you think will happen in this game if it's played by, by real people uh, for real money? Um, Neoclassical economics suggests that the proposer should offer the responder a penny, and then the responder should accept. The logic here is, is quite simple. Uh, for the responder, who we assume is, is rational and self-interested, and 
tries to maximize his own well-being, getting something that is one penny is better than getting nothing. So he or she will accept any positive amount. Knowing that, and because the proposer is also a rational, self-interested person who chooses optimally, he or she will propose a penny in order to keep as much as possible to themselves. Now, do you think that this is what happens in the experiments? Mm, well, I it seems it seems quite implausible. And so actually in, in the experimental results, um, something interesting emerges. We see that um, small offers are indeed often rejected, but more than that, they're also rarely made. Um, in particular, within a shared social group, so if all if if the the two people come from the same village or a tribe or a nation or humanity or even sort of the same um, maybe cohort in, in a school, uh, people tend to offer fair that is fifty fifty splits, and offers that are less than three percent are very often rejected. Moreover, there's uh, a heterogeneity here, uh, which can be observed depending on on the gift giving. Um, norms and um, uh, norms and cultures, and so um, in cultures that are sort of very much concerned with gift giving, we see uh, more high offers, and also oddly, we see that high offers are also <laughs> quite often rejected. Uh, and what that means is basically that the practices of gift giving and receiving also matter, and um, people are different. Not 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 only. Uh, um, within the population on, on, on the planet as a whole, but, but within different cultures. Um, now, um, why does this happen? Well, when it comes to the responder, it seems that low offers are considered defensive. And so the responder would rather see both players receive nothing at all, thereby punishing the proposer for the unfair offer. Now, the deeper question is why low offers are very rarely made. Is it that the responder and the, the proposer anticipates that the responder would reject a low offer, or is there some other motivation? Perhaps the proposers often care about the well-being of the responder and so try to, to offer a split that is close to 50-50. Um, can we distinguish this, this effect from, from the true intentions? Uh, well, in fact, we can, because we can modify this game and conduct a different game that's called the dictator game. Uh, the game was suggested by Kahneman in the late 80s, and then Forsyth et al. Uh, formalized it in 1994. Uh, this game works just as the ultimatum game, but the receiver is passive. Uh, that is, the proposer simply proposes a split and of, of this fixed sum of money, say £10, and then that, that proposal is automatically implemented. So the, the, the receiver has no role in, 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 in determining how the money is going to be split. Funnily enough, even though... Uh, the theoretical results, even though theory suggests that the proposer should propose again a split that would be nine nine ninety nine uh, for himself and then one penny to to the other person, the experimental results are very much at odds with this prediction. Uh, so what we see is the average share given to the the recipient is about twenty percent of a fixed amount, so they still offered something. Um, and over 60% of experimental subjects propose, you know, at least something um, to, to the recipient. Uh, there are, again, a wide cross-cultural uh, variations, but uh, like here and again, whichever, whichever uh, population we, we look at, we see that people keep offering a non-negative amount to, to the recipient. Um, and it's not just adults. So in modified versions of the dictator game, children also tend to allocate at least some of the resource to a recipient. And most five-year-olds share at least half of their gifts. OK. Uh, again, why, why does it matter? What do we learn? So neoclassical economics assumes that people are rational human beings guided purely by self-interest, and they make optimal decisions. And these experiments that I have just talked to you about, they suggest that such view may be too narrow. An understanding of social preferences and the disparity that occurs across individuals and groups can help us create models that better represent reality. Uh, for example, within the financial sector, research supports the existence of a positive relationship between the elements of trust and reciprocity to economic growth as observed in a reduction of defaults in lending programs, as well as the effectiveness of government and central banking policy. 
Um, well functioning of social preferences may assist society in paving the way to new developments through a decrease in the likelihood of market failures, as well as a reduction in transaction costs. Uh, society may utilize social preferences to increase flow of information, to increase transparency and accountability. And um, uh, generally understanding why humans are different and how they're different uh, allows us to, to make, uh, make better models. Now, um, talking again about experiments and the advantages of the method. So why, 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 would we, why, why would we want to use experiments as a method? Well, to begin with, um, experiments are allow uh, economists to apply a rigorous scientific method to questions that concern uh, humans and their behavior. Um, and these, these scientific method can be applied in a precise and controlled environment. Uh, which is good because this allows us to measure specific effects and be confident that uh, the observed uh, effects or lack of thereof are due to um, due to the the treatment variables that we we are interested in. And finally, what is good about experiments is that they allow a very high degree of replicability. So uh, nothing stops you from from taking the experiments that I have just talked to you about today. Um, either the um, newspaper contest or the ultimatum game or the dictator game and trying to conduct it with your own classmates and you'll see that the results would be pretty much the same, uh, which uh, allows us to be to be confident in the results. Um, uh, and finally, uh, some data on, on some of the questions that I've not touched about uh, touched upon today can be quite difficult to collect in the wild and experiments offer a chance to, to collect that data in order to um, uh, enhance our understanding um, about uh, humans and, and their behavior. Um, okay, I'm getting to the conclusion now. Okay, so uh, I'd like to say that economics experiments offer an exciting new methodology that complements theoretical and empirical economics. Uh, and with the rise of the internet, the experiments can, get, can be conducted at scale and involve hundreds of people interacting together. Um, even though it, it, this sounds exciting, of course, it's not a foolproof approach, and so it should be used appropriately. There are some questions where experiments are better uh, suited and, and so are an appropriate method. Um, sometimes it's, it's, all, it's better to um, refer to empirical data and seek for answers there. I think I am going to stop here, uh, and I would happily take questions if there are any. Brilliant. There are lots of questions. We'll get through as many as we can. Uh, okay. We probably won't get through all of them. Um, so first question is, given the issues um, with assuming humans are completely rational, would you say that governments should avoid, um, should avoid purely basing their economic policies on standard economic models and theory? Um, well, I <laughs> the short answer is that 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 governments are not uh, building their models on, on standard economic state theory alone. And in fact, uh, macroeconomics, uh, I'm not a macroeconomist, but my understanding is that macroeconomics is increasingly uh, taking microeconomics into account when when building foundations for their models, and they're increasingly incorporating insights from experimental and behavioral approaches into uh, modeling. Uh, so one way of doing this would be instead of assuming that there's just one single type of of agents interacting in in a macro e economy would be to would be to instead sort of um, you know widen the scope and allow for different types of people. So some would be rational and and self centered, um, others would be altruist, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can you can come up with an arbitrarily complex model to some extent because now we have computers and so uh, we can simulate behaviors um with with sort of richer environments and, and more agents in them thank you and um, somebody just asked um, what's the difference between competitive or individualistic um so the individualist is concerned about maximizing their own well-being regardless of what happens to to the others whereas the competitive one that's a person who actually takes into account what happens to the other people and ensures that basically they they get joy in knowing that they are uh, in some sense sort of performing better than the others if you if you, if if that makes sense so even if maybe it's sort of overall their 
outcome is not the highest, but if if the difference between their outcome and the outcome of the the next best person is is large, then that that makes them um, satisfied, if you wish. And um, next question is: um, Do you believe um, people are ir irrational according to economics, so can't be predicted, or can data be used to predict them anyway? Uh, look, it's a it's a hard question. I would say that people uh, people are at times irrational, but there's also uh, a degree of, of of systematism to that irrationality, if you wish. And so, um, me and and my experiments are concerned with trying to to determine patterns in that irrationality again to hopefully build better models. Thank you. Um, the next question I've got is: um, Do you think that displays of altruism during the uh, dictator game actually show that people are not entirely self-interested, given that they could just be motivated by the fear of guilt or social backlash? Um, exactly. So uh, there, there have been lots of studies conducted on on the dictator game, whereby people tried to rule out alternative explanations. Which you know, like obviously, the first one would be that if anyone offers a positive amount, or maybe they don't understand the rules. Now, you know, you'd make sure that they understand the rules, that you'd, you'd let them play a few times and they would still keep offering uh, a non-negative amount, even though sort of maybe maybe it'll decrease a bit, but they, they, there's still a robust um, observation that there are positive um, offers being made. Um, and uh, they, they do differ by cultures, by gender, by by age. There are lots of factors that play into it, suggesting that, that yeah, we're, we're quite complex and, and we, we're not guided by, um, you know, one particular uh, motivation uh, that is trying to get as much as possible to ourselves. Usually not the case. Also, quite often, sort of even even the same individual could approach different problems differently. So, you know, when it comes to the cake issue, maybe you'd be more generous when, when, than, than when trying to, to, I don't know, split a million pounds or something like that. Um, next we've got, do you think that people will become increasingly altruistic um, and will see even more deviation from self-interest in, for example, the next century? Uh, well, if we, <laughs> if we don't blow up this planet <laughs> uh, completely. Um, Look, I, I think it to a large extent that would depend on on how like on on the course of of where where the society like how the society develops and where where we move to. It, you would probably see more altruism in in societies that are um, better integrated um, and and sort of generally more kind of safe and and coherent. Uh, so if if that's the path that uh, we are taking, then then I would say yes. But if um, well, if we're unfortunate and and um, future future has has more turbulences for us uh, than <laughs> than the pattern might reverse. Um, next, we got how can firms use game theory to optimize the profit that they make? Uh, well, if you take an economics course, you'll you'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I don't 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 think I, I can add much here. It's uh, it's a matter of getting enough data, getting good analysis for that data. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what economic experiment do you think was the most influential in the way we think about behavioral economics? Uh, I would think the sort of the, that general kind of there, there was the sequence of, of experiments conducted by Kahneman and Tversky that were sort of effectively on the edge between economics and and psychology, if you wish, where they've they've shown um, they, they they've not just shown biases, they've also of of the way that we think about things, but also um, they they've shown that those biases are very systematic and portable. And that allowed us to learn uh, quite a bit. That was a breakthrough. So if if you you know if you are interested in the subject, I do recommend looking uh, not just sort of at, at the research that itself. I, I think that sort of Kahneman wrote a few again easily accessible books. Um, so um, you could have a look there for inspiration. Thank you. I'm thinking about recommendations as well. Somebody said, um, "What books would you recommend for reading about rational behavior or experiments models?" So I think you mentioned a bit there, but sort of any any mm -hmm. further recommendations? Uh, uh, coming back to Thaler, so there there were two yeah. books. One one is Nudge. Uh, so Nudge is about kind of this these this idea whereby uh, you can change people's behavior uh, by just sort of nudging them appropriately. So they're they're quite you know. That, that's quite an interesting, easily accessible books about book about how sort of you can change people's behavior uh, using well nudges. And then the other one is misbehaving, uh, which is about rationality again. So um, that would be a nice one um, to to look at. Yeah. 
Um, next one was asked, do you know of any examples where an economics experiment has led to a change in policy, for example, from the government? Um, so there are lots of uh, lots of them. Uh, they happen all the time now, increasingly more. Um, within the UK context, I recommend you looking at what the nudge unit does. So they were they were called the nudge unit. They were a behavioral kind of body within um, the government. I think now they're called the behavioral insights team or something. And so they do um, research that is implemented um, into policy directly. So like little things like. Uh, when you get a utility bill, uh, you get a smiley face if uh, you bef if, if you if your consumption of, of electricity is below average and and a sad face otherwise, and that actually leads to a change in behavior. People become more conscious. They they they're more conscious about um, um, electricity consumption because they want they want to get a smiley face. So little things like that, um, I think would be would be a good start uh, yeah. to to look at. Thank you. Um, quite a lot of people are asking about AI. So do you have any comments or insights on how AI might change any of this or be implemented in any of this in the future? Um, well, it allows us to just scale up, basically. So and this is like to some extent, same with the Internet. Right. So um, before before the Internet was around, experiments would literally sort of involve people coming to a shared office space there for two hours together um trying to trying to complete these experiments which was uh, is still a used method for for specific reasons but it's um uh, it it requires effort and you can probably fit a limited number of people in um now with the internet we can have you know studies with hundreds of people interacting and and you can throw ai in and see what happens so you know you can have um not just people interacting, but also I would imagine like like there would be quite a lot of agents within that environment that are um, guided by AI, and um, that's uh, an exciting exciting direction to expand research. Thanks. Um, the next question is: How does one monitor the motivations behind decisions made in the dictator game? Um, well, I, I've touched upon this sort of in some sense, what you do is you you come up with other plausible explanations as to why this happens. And then you try to eliminate that by designing the experiment in a way that, you know, either switches on or like off that motivation completely or, you know, makes it more pronounced, basically. So maybe, you know, a working hypothesis might be, oh, but would it matter that the person, you know, the, the dictator is actually aware that you know, the money is going to be shared equally uh, with a person. Like, that it's not just an imaginary situation and that, that that second person doesn't actually exist. So you can design the experiment whereby, you know, that actually happens. They see that there are two people, one makes the decision, and then both receive money in an envelope or something. So, and then then sort of like, you know, if, if, if people still keep... Uh, um, offering a positive amount, well, you can sort of rule out some of your hypotheses and move on to the next and, and iterate. Thank you. Um, considering the importance of philosophy in economic experiments, how important is it that politicians examine philosophy when creating economic policies? Uh, uh... Well, I guess it's not important. It's important to not just take into account if the, philosoph the philosophical and also ethical aspects of, of any any policies that are to be implemented, but also um, try and test them before implementing. And so, one way of, of doing that would be to conduct um, an experiment, for example, a field study, whereby uh, once you have a policy or maybe a set of alternative policies, you you, you test them with a small sample of people before rolling them out uh, onto. Uh, onto the population um, in in general. Um, next we've got, do you think that um, the different cultural foundations in different countries change their, uh, change the way their economics or economic models displayed conjunctive behaviour? Oh yes, of course. So again, I've, I've, I've touched upon this yeah. in, in my little speech about the ultimatum behavior, ultimatum game. So that what's interesting there is that it's not just that in, you know, the cultures that are heavily based on gift giving, um, the person who's proposing this split would offer more. It's also, if you offer too much, funnily enough, people will reject the offer. Um, and you would see this in, in some cultures, but not other cultures. And there are, there are lots of like little things within human behavior that, that differs between, between cultures. And so um, that's, you know, important for us as economists to understand, but also 
uh, very important for policymakers when they they are implementing policy because well, if something works in one culture that doesn't necessarily translate into you know that that same policy working well in another culture which suggests the need for more experiments in in a culture specific um setup thank you and um, how do values such as altruism and competitiveness prove to affect economic growth or capabilities um, so altruism, for example, takes um, it, it's, it plays a very important role when it comes to donations. So now we know that um, uh, the the sort of altruists are the people that are most likely to take part in in charitable organisations and donate. Um, and and of course that would have a profound implication on any donation campaigns or sort of any um, any appeals to to raise money for for a charitable cause. cause. Uh, that's not to say that sort of competitive individuals are uh, again sort of in some some sort of you know in some way inferior uh, because because of, of of their preferences. Um, you know those individuals would be very helpful to economy in in other contexts. Um, next, question, how accurate do you believe the current policies are based on the models that have been used and considering the behavioural tendencies of the UK's population? I I am an immigrant in this country. I don't think I'm allowed to comment on, on policy. <laughs> They'll kick me out. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, could increased uh, regulation of financial institutions be used to encourage more rational behaviour and less excessive risk taking in financial markets? Uh, could be. Um, uh, another approach would be more transparency. So from, from again, experimental research, we see that increasing transparency and having a greater degree of transparency in communication between the bank and, and the stakeholders uh, could actually prevent, um, you know, risky behavior and also bank runs, uh, which, you know, is, is a quite a topic these days, it seems. Um, great, thank you. And we've got, um, would you say major economic crises such as the Wall Street crash were based on um, behavioral economics rather than on any other factors? Uh, well, behavior certainly plays a huge role and in, in, you know, uh, this crash and, and, and the crashes to come. And, and that is why sort of understanding how and why people react to certain things is, is of, of quite a, quite a big importance. That's, that's actually sort of something that I study personally and sort of within bank runs specifically. <laughs> so yeah, we are, we are trying to understand better how people react to, um, you know, turbulent, um, situations um, and trying to find ways of, of uh, better guiding them to, um, you know, uh, a sort of good resolution rather than a crash or, yeah. If. <laughs> um, we've got, um, can you tell us more about your experiments about getting patterns? I think it means patterns of irrationality, maybe it must be a typo in the question. Um, yeah, so you would you would like they would pretty much work in the same in the same way as any any experiment. So you would uh, you know you you would stumble upon some some sort of an observation. Um, say this the the observation that I work on now is um, of uh, the fact that uh, you know people like so some some events occur precisely because people believe they're going to occur so think about um think about um herding behavior that we have observed when when covid started right so you know people like there, there was covid and sort of we were going into a lockdown and a lot of people rushed to the shops in a fear that they're going to be shortage of food um and sort of other essentials and then that shortage actually happened purely because people anticipated it to happen but if they, if they were to um uh, you know, act rationally uh, altogether and sort of not not consume as like not not buy as much stuff in advance. We we would have probably avoided the shortage. Uh, that's not to say that people who rushed to buy their pasta were wrong, because in the end, you know, the shortage was there. Uh, so understanding why these situations like these occur and um, and how to control them is is something um, that yeah, sort of they, I I look at now within the context of, of experiments. Great, thank you. And I think we'll make this the last question because we've okay. been posing a lot of questions to you already. Um, which, um, so is conducting experiments as a part of studying economics in Cambridge at all? Do students get an opportunity to do this? Um, so it's very much optional uh, because, uh, you know, conducting an experiment does require a bit of time. And so given given that the, the, the course, the tripers are quite packed, I think the only opportunity really is to do it as, as your um, uh, the third year project um 
but I've, I've known quite a few people that have done it. Uh, and it's, it's an exciting thing that, that you, you can explore if, if sort of you're still into it by, well, by the third year. <laughs> thank you, Dara. We posed a lot of questions to you. So thank That's you for answering right. so many questions. <laughs> Get some um, water it, now. it shows that, uh, yeah, students are obviously really interested in the topic. So thank you. Um, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Hopefully you've been really interested in what Ola and Dario have been talking to you about. And um, hopefully you've got some things that you can now go and follow up on in your own reading and explore. So the super curricular aspect of um, economic aspects that you're interested in even further. Thanks everybody.